May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Last week, the season of Lent began with Ash Wednesday. The ashes are a symbol that we live and die. We make mistakes, we sin against God, and we must live differently. We must live with the end in mind. In order to do this, we can't live any old way we want. We have to discipline our minds, discipline our bodies, and nudge our spirits closer to God's ways. Sometimes we don't like that word discipline, though. It often has that negative meaning for us because we use punishment to get us back on track. We discipline our children when they misbehave, but this Lenten season, I invite you to see discipline in a different light. This is not about punishing ourselves so we do a better job of following God. This season is about being in harmony with the Creator. It's about loving back the one who redeems us. It's about moving towards right behavior because of the Holy Spirit. That's what spiritual discipline does. So today we spend some time exploring one particular expression of discipline, the discipline of reading Holy Scripture. The passage we read in Jeremiah is a particularly important one for me. When I was a boy, I went to a Christian camp with my church. It was my first one and I didn't really know what to expect, but on that first night, after a lot of games and tons of junk food, we were by the beach. The lake was so big you couldn't see the other end of it. That's why they call it the Great Lakes. And as the water lapped up against the beach, a man stood up to speak to our group. He said, God's word is important. He told us it was so important that we needed to get serious about reading it for ourselves. Now, I was 12 years old at the time, and though my family went to church and I knew a lot of things about the Bible, I never read it in any kind of pattern way. And this man stood before us, telling everyone how absolutely <coughs> essential it was. So that night, when I climbed onto the top bunk in a room with four other smelly boys, <laughs> I prayed to God a simple prayer that changed my life. I said, God, don't let me fall asleep until I've read at least one chapter of the Bible each night. So that night I turned to the very first chapter in the very first book, Genesis 1. Each night I would open the Bible and read another chapter, sometimes two or three, and slowly but surely I made my way through the scriptures. God answered my innocent prayer, and I could not sleep unless I read. I went through the first five books as God called the Israelites out of Egypt as a chosen people. Then on to the story of the kings who often failed to follow God. And then I came to the prophets where I heard God's word to me concerning my story. God said he knew me before I was born. That I was set aside for special work to tell others about God. And I told God that I didn't know how to speak. I'm only a boy. A young kid that hardly understands a thing about God. How could I ever tell others about the Lord? And God spoke back through the scriptures. Do not say I am only a boy. You will go to all to whom I send you. This passage has incredible power in my own life. <coughs> because as I read it, I saw me in the story. God was talking to me that night. And I want to encourage 
you today to find your story in the scriptures. Find out how God has already spoken to your situation. Find out what God has to say to you today. But I imagine there are some of us that feel like I did when I was a 12-year-old boy. Someone is standing up in front of you telling just how important this book is, but what good will it do? Plenty of people have opened up the Bible and started to read its words only to be completely confused. Only to be left wondering, what in the world does it mean? <coughs> the Bible moves from story to story, hardly stopping to explain the meaning behind it. The Bible can be an incredibly intimidating thing to read. Not only is it really long, but it comes from cultures we hardly know anything about. It's enough to make any of us feel like a boy or a girl when it comes to God's Word. You know, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, where everyone celebrates the American Buffalo. The logo for the Buffalo Bills football team is, of course, a, a giant buffalo. I read recently that they are the largest land animal in North America, bigger than a moose, bigger than a grizzly bear. They can weigh up to 2,800 pounds. Perhaps the scariest part of the wild buffalo is that they travel in herds, and once they get moving, a stampede can decimate anything in its path. There's a story from the 1800s of two men who hear a stampede in the distance coming at them at night. They jump onto their horses and ride as fast as they can to get away from this stampede, but eventually they're overtaken by this herd of buffalo, and there's this blinding dust and gnats and flies stinging them, and as the herd surrounds them, they turn their horses and they go with the stampede. At the end, they jump off their horses, completely exhausted by this stampede. These animals are massive and dangerous. At one point, there were an estimated 30 to 60 million buffalo in the Great Plains. There were no predators that could attack these animals, especially when they were in a herd, so they just grew and grew and grew. I think that's similar to how people might feel about the Bible. It's so big. Sometimes it's been used in such destructive ways. Is it really worth reading? Can we really open it up and not get caught in the hurricane of God's Word? When I look at my own life, I think the Bible is what helped point me in a worthwhile direction. It is what caused me to mature. Sure, there are plenty of things I don't understand in the Bible. There are lots of things I once thought I understood, but as I grow, I know the Bible and life and God are far more complicated than I thought. But the good news is that when we look at Scripture, we grow up. We don't have to stay in a place where Scripture is intimidating, where taking the time to understand Scripture seems more <coughs> trouble than it's worth. You don't have to be stuck in the stampede. Just keep moving in the right direction, and you'll come out all right. So here are a few thoughts on reading Scripture in this Lenten season. First, keep in mind that Famous people throughout history point to Scripture as primary for themselves and the world. George Washington once said, You can't govern the world the right way without the Bible. The philosopher Immanuel Kant said, I believe the Bible is of the greatest benefit to humans. Any attempt to belittle it is a crime against humanity. Martin Luther King Jr. was inspired by Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in leading the civil rights movement. Even Gandhi, who was <coughs> barred entrance to a Christian church in South Africa when first exploring the Christian faith, had great respect for Christ. So he even studied and quoted Scripture. And to name one current person, 
actor Tom Hanks, who celebrates the intellectual pursuit found in churches, says, Church seems to be the only place where we pursue the great, unanswered questions humans have always asked. When you read the scriptures, you are working to answer those questions. You are preparing yourself for the great unknown that lays ahead for all of us. When you participate in the spiritual discipline of studying scripture, you join millions across the world and throughout history who long to know God, who want to live and die experiencing true life. Second, know that lives change because of reading scripture. There was a woman named Pamela who was in a prolonged court fight to be reunited with her children. She was on the verge of hopelessness. Her psychologist had advised her to give up on reconnecting with her children and move on with her life. Feeling as though God had abandoned her and filled with despair, she decided to check in with God one more time by reading scripture. She read a passage from Jeremiah 31 that says, A voice is heard, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted. She collapsed on the ground, weeping certain this was the end. But a quiet voice told her to keep reading. She picked up the Bible again and read it. More, It says, Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for the Lord is pleased with the work you will do. Your children will return to their own land. Pamela's life was transformed. She was renewed. She resolved to never give up on her children and eventually won a landmark court victory. She met with others who were undergoing similar circumstances and formed a self-help group and eventually founded the Rachel Foundation, which works to reintegrate families. I encourage you, as you explore the scriptures, do it regularly. There are lots of ways to read scripture. Our disciple Bible study class that meets on Tuesdays reading huge portions of scripture over nine months. We read it quickly to get an overview of the entire Bible. You could also read very short portions and spend the entire day reflecting on just a few words from the scriptures. But I want to encourage you to participate in a specific challenge over this Lenten season. Let us, as a church, challenge ourselves to read <coughs> one book of the Bible several times over from now to Easter. I invite you to read 1 Thessalonians. It has five chapters and is three and a half pages long. You can read it five times between now and Easter if you read one chapter every day, Monday through Friday. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to read this book at least once before Easter. Scripture can be an intimidating thing, but I read recently that if there is just one thing we can do as a church to help people grow in their faith, it's reading Scripture and applying it to our lives. So, in preparation for the celebration of the resurrected Christ, I ask you to make this small but profound commitment to read the Bible with me. If you will read 1 <coughs> Thessalonians at least one time before Easter, will you please raise your hand now if you'll read it? Will you read it two times? Keep your hand up if you will read it three times. I challenge you to read it up to five times before Easter. As you read, may you experience God's love for yourself and learn in a fuller way what it means to love your neighbors as yourself. May God's word speak to you as you join with your church and the world in studying the Bible. Even the boy prophet Jeremiah was terrified when God's word came to him. But know that you are consecrated. You are selected by God to be known 
and to be loved and to share with others about God's transformative love. When it comes to encountering God's word, you have nothing to fear because God is with you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are with us and that as we read the scriptures, we know that we can grow in you, our faith can grow, and that we can know you and follow you in a, a deeper and fuller way. Lord, be with us as we read your word. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Next week we're going to start a new series. It's called 24 Hours That Changed the World. And we're going to take some time to go in depth into those final 24 hours before Jesus' crucifixion <coughs> on the cross. So I invite you to come back and join us for that new series. And now I invite you to stand and let's sing together our final hymn.